Okay, good morning. We're going to get started. I am delighted to welcome you to the Financial Planning and DM session um, with Pat Bergmeier. Pat is a certified financial planner who is focused on special needs financial planning. He obtained his certified financial planner certi certification and the designation of a chartered special needs consultant through the American College of Financial Services. These designations have helped Pat address the unique circumstances and requirements for planning for a, a families that have dependents who are with special needs. Thank you, Pat. Real quick, does anybody not have a uh, folder? So if you have to take a minute just so I know who's in my audience here today, because I'm going to try to tailor my topic to you guys to make most efficient use of your time. Uh, anybody in here have a loved one between the ages of birth and five with special needs? No? One? Um, how about five to 14? Okay. 14 to 18? All right, who's got adults over 21? That's what I figured. Okay. So I'm going to walk around. I am a big fan of audience participation, but I know I only have 50 minutes to make you all an expert in special needs financial planning. So uh, if, if you don't mind questions and answers, I will be hanging around for a while after, uh, after my presentation. Feel free to stop by my table to ask me any questions that are more personalized that you want to talk about one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but the gist of this presentation is, if you've been, as you've been navigating the complexities of this planning, has anybody found it relatively easy to navigate special needs planning? No. How about navigating Social Security and government benefits? We don't, we don't have any Social Security representatives, right, in the room? All right. So before I pick on Social Security, it's good to weed out that there's nobody in here that I'm gonna, going to insult. So it's confusing. It's frustrating. It's... It can be daunting. I mean, there's an acronym after acronym you need to know. There is an ever-changing world of government benefits. And I guess good news or bad news, there's no manual for this, right? The school district didn't give you anything how to navigate this type of planning. You know, your local uh, county or state resource providers, they didn't give you a, here's what you have to do because you have a loved one. No, it's, it's good because there is no one-size-fits-all. That applies from a legal standpoint. So the attorneys that you work with, and do I have any attorneys? Luckily in the room, we got a couple. Any of you guys focus on special needs estate planning? No, good. <laughs> and nothing against that. I always use the medical analogy. I mean, there's, there's spinal surgeons, there's cardiovascular specialists, there's knee surgeons. They all have their niche, right? You're not going to have your, the knee surgeon perform the heart surgery on you. You're going to work with somebody that does what you need them to do every single day. They're not dabbling in it. You don't want to be somebody's guinea pig, right, that's going to research. Well, uh, let's Google special needs trust. Here's a template that I can give you. No, you want somebody that has mastered this, that lives it, breathes it, and practices it every single day. So my first disclaimer, I'm not an attorney. So I don't do what the attorneys do. Conversely, they don't do what we do. You need a very complementary relationship with your financial tax advisors and your legal advisors. Because you'll see, when it comes to special needs planning, there's not just one stop shop where you can go and get everything done. It's an ongoing planning process. It'll change because the world of government benefits is going to change and your loved one's situation is going to change. So for the majority of you that have older dependents with special needs, um, the biggest thing is who in here feels that to some extent their loved one is going to be dependent on them for the rest of your life? Okay. So that way we got that out of the way. We all know that we're going to need to not only create a special needs trust, but also fund it, right? So a special needs trust document, the main purpose, and it gets confusing what the difference is, is a special needs trust document is legal paperwork. It's very different than a special needs trust fund. So a special needs trust fund has assets in it, has income in it, income producing assets, marketable securities, things that can actually be used to generate things income to pay for things that are going to give your loved one quality of life. They're going to pay for things that are going to provide for the lifetime care needs, anything that the government doesn't pay for through Medicare or through Medicaid or any other county provided services. Does anybody have, uh, I always call them neurotypical children, those that are not affected? Right? Or anybody else in your family that is going to provide a role in your loved one's life in the future? caregiving, maybe, successor guardian, possibly. 
there's a lot of other individuals that we forget that get lost in the mix in this type of planning. And it's usually, these, the, say, the siblings that aren't affected. We, we expect them to fulfill certain roles, right? We expect them to be there for their brother or sister logistically. Well, what if they get a job offer and they live in, on the East Coast, but the job offer, dream job of theirs or their partner in life is on the West Coast? Are we gonna, going to tell them not to take that job because they have to live within driving distance of their sibling? I don't think that's fair to them. I mean, and I hate saying burden, but you don't want to put all the responsibility on somebody else that's going to have their own life decisions and life path to take to limit them because they, they can't do that because they need to stay close to their brother or sister or to their cousin just in case something happens. So there's organizations out there, and they're usually they're in most states, um, that provide something called care management. There is one called Planned Lifetime Assistance Network. Anybody ever hear of them? Uh, there's a plan of PA, there's a plan New Jersey, plan of uh, New York, plan of Connecticut, and there's plans all across the country. So these are organizations, it's a nonprofit um, that you would privately pay for to provide services to take some of the, re the responsibility, could even be off your shoulders. Has anybody wanted to vacation on their own and without having to worry about it, are things gonna be okay when I'm gone? So that you can hire these agencies even while you're here to do these certain things that uh, plan, Planned Lifetime Assistance Network. Better get up to where the computer is so I can move things. That would be helpful. So if you Google Planned Lifetime Assistance, uh, Assistance Network, I think it's plan.org. It should tell you every state's location so you can contact your local organization. So inside your folder, there's a lot of information. I'm based outside of Philly. I'm licensed all across the country, though. I do have colleagues that are situated in different states all across the country in case you do want to meet with somebody or talk to somebody that is logistically closer to you. I do feel there is something about special needs planning that sitting down face to face with your advisor is really needed. So, um, but inside your folder, there is an evaluation form. And I've been doing these presentations for 10 years. Every single family client I've worked with, they all have pretty much the same goals. They're just quantifiable differently. Um, but some of the concerns all stay the same. Biggest thing, lifetime care and quality of life. Who thinks the government's going to be there to provide quality of life? No. The government is there to, to allow our individuals to survive. Barely. It's not thriving. Who, who can thrive off of $771 a month of SSI? We all know Medicare and Medicaid don't pick up everything, right? Medical, medical care can be expensive, but that's why we do this. That's why you go through the exercise of sitting down with an attorney, paying them, pretty good fee, to draft this most important legal document, the special needs trust, because you're saying, hey, I have somebody that may not be able to create their own quality of life. I have somebody that may be dependent on us for the rest of our lives, even as we navigate our 30 to 40 years of retirement income planning. We need to make sure that there's funds for the rest of our lives, if we're mom and dad, and for the rest of our loved one's life. I call it a three-person retirement. Planning for two lifetimes of income is very, very different than planning for one lifetime of income. So the care, we talked about that, uh, protecting government benefits. If you are on a benefit, we sure as heck don't want to lose it due to an accidental inheritance, improper planning. Uh, everybody knows the resource limit for Medicaid eligibility, $2,000. There's some higher limits depending on what you're, you're on. That number hasn't changed in, in 10 years. So we can't leave money in our loved one's name. If they start saving and contributing to their 401k, they could be ineligible for government benefits. So like it's this catch-22. We want to save, but we need to save in the right places. The three-person retirement, one of the other harder questions, the answer is if you have more than one child, how do you provide equitably? Do you? I've learned equal doesn't mean fair. Fair doesn't mean equal. But trying to provide for everybody is a goal of most parents, especially if you have grandchildren. How do we provide for the next generation while also taking care of our, our loved one that may not be able to create their own way? And then I think one of the biggest things I would imagine everybody in this room wants to do this is minimize the exposure that Uncle Sam has to taking from what you leave behind. You all know that your child or their loved one does not get a tax break because they have a disability, right? They're taxed just like, some of, just like us. And in some cases, depending on the asset, harsher. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we go forward. Um, so the mistakes that we usually see, lack of coordination amongst the advisors, or the advisors just aren't the right advisors. I see this more often in the financial advising space where you have 
families that have a special needs situation where the advisor hasn't even asked about their plans for their child, they might not even know that they even have a child with special needs. And they're giving the same cookie cutter investment and insurance planning advice that they give to everybody else your same age. You should be in the same asset allocation that everybody your age should be in because that's what you should do. No, it's, it's different. If, if, you're, if you have a 30-year-old dependent adult child that could potentially live another 40 to 60 years, and you're in your 60s, well, you're not planning like you're a 60-year-old. You're planning like you're a 30-year-old. You should be investing like you are a 30-year-old. You've got plenty of time for those assets to go through all, what is always short-term downturns in the market and allow those, Im those investments to recover because you need that money for the next 60 years, not the next 30 or 40 years of your life. So that's a big thing that I see in asset allocation. It's all cookie cutter, boilerplate, nothing tailored to what you need to do differently. The legal advisors are the other things. I mean, drafting special needs trusts and, special, and legal documents, having it done and having it done right, there's a very, very big difference. And sometimes you don't know that the special needs trust is done incorrectly until it's too late, which is when it gets funded and the Department of Human Services comes to look at it and says, whoa, 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 this was not drafted the right way. So now we need to, depending on the state you live in, we either need to make it the, the right type of trust with the right provisions in it if your state allows it, or everything you now left to this trust is accountable resource. We have to turn it into a different type of special needs trust that, by the way, there's a required Medicaid reimbursement on. We don't want that to happen. So proactive planning and doing it with the right people is important. Um, young children, younger dependents, procrastination, prioritization, whatever you want to call it, I don't have a line outside my office on Monday mornings. Neither do most of the special needs estate planning attorneys. Do you know why? Who wants to talk about this? Nope. Who wants to worry about when you're not here? It's the biggest fear I see most of my parents have. They want to live one day longer than their child. It's a, it's a 180 degree paradigm shift of your typical financial planning where parents want to live a long life, pass away in their 90s or 100, and their children have lived many years behind them. When you have a dependent that's been dependent on you for a while, I see some of the concerns are, well, I have no idea what's going to happen if I'm not here, so I can't die. I need to live till I'm 120 years old. So you don't, want to, you don't want to deal with it. You know there's other priorities. When your kids were younger, maybe you had IEPs, maybe you had stuff with the school district and therapies, and now you're navigating health care. And while you know it's important, it's getting pushed down the pile of all the other things to worry about. But I can't stress the importance even more. Look, the government's not going to be there. School districts aren't always going to be there. It really is required of you as parents to advocate, to be proactive in this planning to make sure that you're protecting what you want protected. Um, so those are the mistakes that we'll see. Three main areas of special needs planning. I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to go through it fast because I want to try to get as much of this to get. I could probably talk for three hours on this topic. So condensing it into 45 minutes is always fun. Um, three main areas. I feel these are all equally important. For whatever reason, they are not given equal importance in the community. So everybody will gravitate first to the legal side of this planning, right? I don't know. Maybe it just brings more allure. And they'll say, well, I need to meet with an attorney because I need these legal documents in place. These up here are all basic. Everybody needs these types of documents. A will, who gets what and when. If we have minor children, who is going to be the guardian. Uh, financial and medical powers of attorney. If, you're, if, you have, if you are over 18, you would definitely want to be able to appoint somebody to make decisions for you financially or medically if you're incapacitated. And when your children or your dependents turn 18, you would want to still have an involvement in their life on those two big important decisions. The only way to do that is through powers of attorney or guardianship, which if I have time, I'll talk about. And then trust, we'll talk about them, They're the special needs trust specifically. I mean, there's many types of trusts, all with different usages. Um, so will, basic stuff, most of you know about a trust. Just think of a trust as a protected barrier. That bubble around those words provides protection mainly against spending habits. It's not a blank checkbook. They can't just access a trust and do whatever they want with it. But it also protects against litigation, creditors, divorce, other bad habits that might be fostered by access to cash. So. A trust in planning for spouses, for neurotypical children or dependents, there's some very crucial roles that this can play to protect wealth for future generations. Um, but that special needs trust is one of the most important, and that's where this $2,000 resource limit comes into play. Um, so government benefits. Anybody here an expert? I didn't think so. Who would like access to a, go a government benefit expert when it comes to navigating some of these confusing benefit applications? So there are individuals out there that specialize in this, that 
focus their practice on helping individuals apply for SSI, appeal SSI, apply for Social Security Disability, appeal a denial of Social Security Disability, navigate waivers and other services through counties and states, uh, Section 8 housing, food stamps, whatever it may be, is just getting an understanding of what may be out there, what's an entitlement benefit to my loved one, what's an eligibility-based benefit to my loved one. So it's confusing and it is frustrating because Social Security doesn't give you an answer like 24 hours later to say, hey, you're approved, right? could take three, six months and then you get denied and then you have to go through the process again of appealing. So um, really quick on the government benefits because it confuses people. Eligibility-based benefits are means tested where you can't have under a certain threshold of assets. Just, just remember $2,000. Some of them are higher, but if you know $2,000, you know that that's the financial limit. And you also have to be considered disabled. And disability under Social Security's definition, significant physical or cognitive impairment expected to last longer than 12 months or result in death, and you cannot engage in what is called substantial gainful activity, earning roughly $1,000 a month of earned income. So the Social Security definition of disabled as, a, as an adult is very strict, so that's why it's sometimes tricky to get approved as disabled. There are some things that you may need supports, but you may not be disabled enough to qualify for benefits. So it's a, it's a confusing situation. Eligibility ba or entitlement benefits are different. We all contribute to those of us that are working to FICA every paycheck, right? Our FICA taxes create our entitlement to collect off Social Security in the future, or if we became disabled, or our family can collect off of it if we die prematurely. So the entitlement benefit of Social Security, and when it comes to navigating this when you have a disabled adult child is, there's a very important age, and I still yet to find an exact black and white answer on this, but to be considered a DAC, that's actually the acronym, Disabled Adult Child, which means that this individual was disabled as an adult after their 18th birthday prior to their 22nd birthday in the Social Security system with a disability. If they are a DAC, that means they're entitled to collect off the parent's Social Security work record, which typically is going to be much higher than what they're able to contribute off of their own earnings. So that's key because sometimes, though, if you procrastinate and don't do some of these applications bef before 22, that DAC benefit is never an option. Or if a disability onsets after age 22, it's not an option. So then they are limited to collect off their own work record if they've contributed enough quarters. You get Social Security, after uh, two years, you become entitled to Medicare. So Social Security, gateway to Medicare, SSI, Supplemental Security Income, gateway to Medicaid. If you have further questions on benefits, just talk to me afterwards because you could have a whole hour on that alone. Um, other important age is 18, age of majority. 21, if they were in school in, I, in an IP, you can transition at 21. Uh, 22 we talked about with a DAC benefit. 26, anybody know the importance of age 26? Two reasons. Health insurance, big one, right? So 26 is when they're typically kicked off your health insurance, unless maybe your employer will cover a disabled adult child past age 26, obviously, if you're still working there. Anybody else know the reason for age 26 of the importance? Bingo. So disability onset before your age 26, you have the ability to contribute to an ABLE account. Now there's legislation where they're going to bump that age up. I don't know why they picked an age to begin with. It doesn't make any sense, especially 26. I mean, why 26? Um, so those things could change, but these are things to know when it comes to navigating some of the savings options. And like I said, there's resources to help you navigate this. There's experts that you can tap into and say, I'm going to pay you whatever it might be, your hourly rate or a flat fee, because frankly, I don't want to deal with the frustration of Social Security and having to navigate this on my own. And I want to get it done the first, first go around the right, uh, correctly. All right, so mistakes that people will make. These are the two common, common ones first, and they'll go together. Well, we're just going to disinherit our loved one. We know they can't have less than more than $2,000, so we don't leave them anything. We take them out of our will. We remove them as a beneficiary uh, on our anything that has a beneficiary designation. So now, good, they don't get anything if we die. Who dictates quality of life at that point, though? They become a ward of the state. Not the best situation. So that will usually go with a morally obligated gift. Parents will say, let's say Johnny has a disability. Johnny. We won't leave him anything, but Susie's his older sister, so we're going to leave everything to Susie to, in Susie's name because she's his older sister, and that's what older sisters do. They take care of their younger brothers. Nothing against anybody else in your family, but that's a morally obligated gift, meaning that there's no legal recourse saying, Susie, you have to use this money on your, on your brother's behalf. 
And if you leave it outright to Susie, what I talk about a trust protecting against, spending habits, spending issues, bad habits, legal issues, they get sued, creditors hurt, you know, she gets in debt, she's married and gets divorced, she dies first and leaves everything to her family or to her partner. It could just leave things to be a mess. So you wanna make sure you do it the right way. And the other thing you wanna do is you wanna communicate to anybody else that may do anything for your child to not screw up all the hard work you're going to do and say, make sure that if you do do anything or gonna leave anything to Johnny, you have to leave it to him the way where it's not gonna disrupt his government benefits and that's where the special needs trust comes into play. There's two types, really quickly, because if you start Googling things and you look at what's a special needs trust, by definition, a special needs trust, if you typically ask an attorney, is a, is a trust created and funded by the individual's own assets to protect government benefit eligibility because they were otherwise disqualified because they had money in their name. That's referring to the type of special needs trust I would hope none of you in this room ever have to create, which is a first party special needs trust or a self-settled special needs trust. So by definition, special needs trust, that is what it means, but it, it is kind of used interchangeably with the proactive type of special needs trust, which is the third party. The third party special needs trust is a trust you will create or anybody else can create for your loved one. And the reason for this, it's third party, meaning it's funded by third party assets, not assets of your, of your loved one. That means that this money was never considered theirs. This ass the third party special needs trust can have unlimited assets in it, can be funded with pretty much anything, and if they pass away and there is at are assets left in the trust, no government payback. It goes back to whoever you want it to go to. That first party special needs trust, there is a required Medicaid reimbursement on, which is why you hopefully never have to create one, unless you've got something through a settlement or a malpractice personal injury, or they were working, saving money, and now they, you know, the ability to work still has, you know, they become debilitated, they can't work, and now they need to move all this money that they were saving out of their name into a first party special needs trust. So really high level, the type you will create with an attorney and you will fund or anybody else will fund on behalf of your loved one is a third party, also known as a supplemental needs trust. Choosing a trustee, hard decision to make of the other ones. Uh, no pun intended, you do need to trust the individual if you're gonna name a person. If you don't have an individual you trust or you don't want them acting alone, you can name a corporate fiduciary as well. There's certain banks that are really good being special needs trustees. Uh, there are certain nonprofit agencies that, will, that focus solely on being trustees over special needs trusts. There's no right or wrong answer to that. I will tell you it is a job being a trustee. Anybody in here a trustee over a special needs trust? So it can be time consuming. But the good news is you can delegate some of those responsibilities. Look, you don't need to be the investment advisor. Delegate that to an investment advisor. You don't need to file the taxes. File that to a tax advisor. You have questions on government benefits. Don't try to become the expert. Hire an expert and pay for it out of trust assets. But you as trustee or whoever you appoint, look, they have, they have sole discretion. It has to be written that way. Sole discretion over how those assets in the special needs trust are used. So you really want somebody that knew you, knows your child. It's a personal touch to say this is what we we would want for them. Um, and then back, a uh, big thing, when should it be funded? Has anybody quantified, if I died yesterday, what's my child need for the rest of their life? Who doesn't even wanna think about that question? So nobody thinks about it because it's a moving target, right? Government benefits aren't set in stone. But when you start thinking about, it, all right, gosh, if they still live with me, I'm indirectly paying for a lot of the things that give them quality of life or care needs. If we wanna go on a vacation or we need to do something, I'm paying for it out of pocket. As long as the primary caregiver is here, mom or dad typically, you do not need to put a dime into this special needs trust. You're the living, breathing special needs trust, you're just called mom and dad. As long as you're here, you're gonna do everything financially that special needs trust is going to do. We need that special needs trust funded when you are gone to continue doing what you were doing. So you really don't need to be transferring assets into this special needs trust while you're alive, unless you're older and you're doing it for tax planning or gifting. Good question? Right, and you may get into this later, but how does this change for a spouse? So for a spouse, so that you're getting into really Medicaid planning and uh, you know future long-term care expense planning. That you really want to talk to an attorney that is not only versed in special needs law, but elder law as well. Um, most of the attorneys that focus, focus on special needs planning are pretty good in elder law as well. But there's certain Medicaid planning techniques, uh, gifting assets to trust, satisfying five-year periods where you have to wait till Medicaid could come into play. Um, that's a whole other conversation. And look, I, I, I deal with the Huntington's community as well, and there's a lot of 
a lot of similarities there where it's like, well, if we got divorced, would this be better? Well, that's a, I'm not answering that question. That's where you really want to talk to the legal counsel that's going to direct you on what's best tax-wise, what's best in the future benefit planning world. Okay. So funding it, you don't need to do it now. You just want to, you need it. You need a funding strategy in the future. You can't be the default, which is, I don't know, whatever we don't end up spending will be left, maybe. Uh, and then Uncle Sam's just going to come in and take whatever the taxes are. That's like the least efficient approach to it. And the, th the thing I worry about, especially for the clients whose w wealth we manage, is you work hard to save money and invest it. So it's there for future consumption, right? So things that you need to spend money on, want to spend money on retirement. The last thing I would want my clients doing is worrying about spending their money in retirement just to make sure there's money left back behind when they die. So then every time you need to, you want to go on a trip or go out to eat or have, do something entertainment related, no matter what you say, in the back of your mind, that's less money for the trust. It's not fair. It's not fair to you. It's, you want to be able to live the life that you need, live the life that you want in retirement, take care of your child to whatever financial extent that means in retirement, live a very long life, and then make sure the trust gets funded adequately to continue paying for what you were paying for for many years after you're gone. So that takes a different approach. It takes a different approach to investing, it takes a different approach to taxes, to insurance strategies. So uh, I'm gonna skip over ABLE. You can come talk to me afterwards about that just for the sake of time. Guardianship versus power of attorney. At 18, you know you need to make a decision. Do I do a guardianship proceeding? Do I have my, my loved one sign a power of attorney? There's pros and cons of each. Uh, I have a really good kind of a white paper that summarizes the pros and cons of each if you want it. Let me know. The one thing you don't want to do is go to an attorney that just because, you know, they see, oh, well, your, your child is an MD, you need to do guardianship. Guardianship's a couple thousand dollars, right? Guardianship, you go to court, you're pretty much stripping your loved one from all the independent decision making. You don't have to do that. If they have the capacity to sign a contract, which is a power of attorney document, you can still be involved medically with the doctor's conversations. You can still be involved with helping them financially but you're not taking away all their independence, their ability to sign any contract, like a job application or a ma getting married. So being educated by the right, right attorney for what's best for your loved one, what's best for, the, for you, is key when it comes to navigating that guardianship versus power of attorney question. All right, so care management. I talked about it briefly, but there's a document that will help, um, and obviously getting your loved one's input in this will be huge, which is called a letter or memorandum of intent. Specifically what it does, it just spells out your hopes and dreams for the future of your, of your dependent. What their hopes and dreams are. You need to give the trustee an idea what to spend this money on, right, when you're gone. This gives them a roadmap to say, here's what we want, here's what we don't want, here's the living arrangements we're okay with, the ones we are not okay with, um, here's where we would want you know, travel to occur, if it's ball games, season tickets, all those things as parents you probably have up here, put it down on paper. Give somebody a path to follow to say, this is what we would want for our, for our loved one. Um, if you need a template of that, I can get you one, uh, just to give you an idea of what would go into it. Uh, so financial planning. So everything I've talked about so far, it's not even what we do on a daily basis. This is just all the different parts of the special needs plan. The, the legal part, the government benefits and care management is the second part, the emotional part of the planning. But then a lot of these things that we talked about cost money. And without enough resources or without enough funding, quality of life may not exist. So the whole purpose of creating a special needs trust, quality of life and lifetime care, if you don't fund it adequately, it may never get done. I'm not saying it defeats the purpose of creating a special needs trust document, but you need to say, all right, we created the document. It's an empty bucket. It's a, it's a stack of paperwork after we leave the attorney's office. That stack of paperwork will do absolutely nothing for your child unless there's a different stack of paperwork, cash, investments, that go into that trust someday to be able to be spent. So what makes it different? Again, three-person retirement, Social Security decisions. If you do have a child that is entitled to collect off your Social Security benefit, usually you're not going to start your Social Security benefit at age 62 then. Does anybody know how much Social Security compounds by guarantee from age 62 to your full retirement age if you defer collecting Social Security retirement? 6%. Is anybody's investments going up guaranteed by 6% every year? No. It, it, they're up now probably 17 18%, yes, but not every year you're going to see 6% compound growth plus cost of living adjustments. Your dependent, if they're collecting off your benefit, they're entitled to 50% of your benefit when you retire. 
in addition to what you get. So if you get 2,500, they're going to get 1,250. But if you start at 62, you're permanently reducing your benefit. Guess who else's benefit you're permanently reducing? Your loved ones. So if you are married, you look at both of your benefits and you see, okay, can we, when does it make sense for one of us to collect? Do we defer the others? Maybe we take one at full retirement age, defer the others to 70 because it's a 7% guaranteed compounding from full retirement age to 70. So all these things are different when it comes to Social Security election. The investing we talked about, insurance planning, and then you know, beneficiaries. If Once you create your legal documents, you do need to then work with your financial advisors to make sure all of your accounts are updated correctly to reflect the legal documents you drafted. So funding it. This is the fun part, where we get to talk taxes at 9.30 in the morning on a Saturday. So tax-wise, everything up there is taxed differently. And it depends. All of you are coming from different states, so your state estate tax your state inheritance tax, should you have one, you better know how that works. But federally, federally right now, we have the largest exemption that we have ever seen for the federal estate tax. Let's just call it roughly $23, $24 million if you're married, half of that if you are single. And if you are not worth above that, I guess good news or bad news, you don't owe taxes. If you are worth more than that, good news or bad news, you're going to owe close to a 40% federal estate tax, your, well, your estate will when you die. When I started in 2005, it was, I believe, in a million dollar exemption. You couldn't share or combine expenses with spouses. It was a use it or lose it type of situation. Um, but that was a million. It went up, disappeared for 11 months in 2010, and then it got increased after that in three million, two and a half, three million, and now it's up to the ridiculously high number that it is now when we have a growing federal deficit. So does anybody have money on taxes being lower in the future? No, I don't think so. You can count income taxes, estate transfer taxes, whatever it might be. We all know there's a Social Security issue, right? I think it's, what, 20, 2033, 2035? They're simply saying there's going to be less contributors than re people receiving it, so we're going to need to fix that problem. They could just create a new tax. It says everybody else that's working, you're levied, or even retired, you're levied X percent just to fix this issue. So it could happen. So being mindful how things are taxed, the federal government, they count everything, everything up there. They lump it all into this pot. If you're below the threshold, no taxes. If you're above it, that tax is due within nine months. So they, they do count life insurance. Some states, for state, estate, or inheritance taxes, like Pennsylvania, I'm outside of Philadelphia, they don't count life insurance. They count everything else up there, but with the exception of life insurance. That escapes all taxation. Uh, state of Pennsylvania's inheritance tax is 4.5%. If it's from parent to child or grandparent to grandchild, and actually also up. But if you go further out, siblings, it's 12% and everybody else, it's 16 on everything. Everything that you own, no exemptions, dollar one. If you have an aunt or uncle leaving money to somebody in, in Pennsylvania, it's a 16% inheritance tax. So check what your state's taxes, be cognizant of that and say, all right, what am I going to leave behind to fund the trust? How is it going to be taxed? Getting us into the conversation of pre-tax versus Roth retirement accounts, the absolute worst from a tax planning standpoint, least tax efficient vehicle to leave behind to the next generation's pre-tax retirement account. So traditional IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, thrift savings plans, 457s, whatever your accounts that you're contributing to for retirement where you're deferring income taxes today under the guise that you're saving taxes, you're really not saving, you're just kicking the tax can down the road. But you're deferring taxes at a what has been right now until 2026, very favorable tax rates to a future tax, uh, future tax year where we have no idea where taxes are going to be. And when we die, guess who gets to deal with all that embedded income tax? Anybody in here have an IRA? All right, so I would imagine everybody that has an IRA know what's I, what IRA stands for, right? Individual retirement account. You can keep your hands up. For those of you that have an IRA, who knows what IRD stands for? Yeah, that's usually what I see. It's like a, the opposite wave. The hands all go down. So IRD, income in respect of a decedent. So when we die, non-spouses we're talking about here, our non-spouse beneficiaries have to deal with our income tax liability. That's the income in respect of the decedent, us, who we died. So this tax, this income tax, currently, and mind you, there is a, 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 an act, in, I think, that Congress or House right now called the SECURE Act, that's going to change this dramatically if it gets passed. They have three options to deal with that income tax. Option one, worst option, give me all my money. 
I want to spend it. I, I want to consume it today. So if there's a million dollar 401k my dad left me, I don't care. Give me it. I'm, I want to spend that million dollars. Well, you don't get a million dollars. That your son or daughter throws a million dollar line item of ordinary income tax on their 1040 plus the rest of their income taxes. And then how much at a million dollars of ordinary income do you think they're going to pay in federal income taxes? 37%? Gone. Right away. So that's a big chunk of money. But remember, these are favorable tax rates right now. Semi-favorable, I guess. So ideally, your attorney or somebody like us is the one sitting down saying, do not do that. That is a silly decision. You can also create a trust that prevents them from doing that, too. Um, option two is, well, I, I want my money. I don't want to pay all those taxes right now, but I want it now to spend it. So give it to me over the next five years. So equal installments, 200 grand per year to the accounts exhausted over five years. But hey, remember, 200,000 is getting thrown on top of the rest of their ordinary income for that year. Depending on what they make, if they're successful, that could be bumping them up into much higher brackets. If they aren't so successful and they were claiming dependency exemptions or other things, they may not be able to claim them anymore because they, their showing is making too much. And the last option, which is the option today, is called a, a stretch IRA or a decedent IRA, where they receive the IRA, the IRS looks at their age, puts it against this mortality table and says, you have to take out a relatively small amount every year based on their age, pay the income taxes on that, but the rest can grow tax deferred. Sounds pretty good, right? Everybody knows we live in an immediate gratification society. So the deferral of income taxes also means the deferral of what? Enjoyment, spending, consumption. If, we can't, if we're gonna defer the taxes, meaning we can't spend it. So not a lot of people like that idea. So this SECURE Act is gonna remove option three. And it's going to say maximum stretch is 10 years because the, the IRS needs their tax revenue. And this is a, a perfect opportunity for them to get it. So what do you do, which if you're like a lot of people, you have the bulk of your money in tax deferred, never income taxable accounts. Well, you have to analyze, do I kind of screw the immediate gratification concept and pay some taxes now? Does my employer offer a Roth 401k or a Roth 403b where I can pay my taxes today at a known rate? get the government out of my pocket for the rest of my life and my kids' lives, and get all this compound interest completely tax-free in the future for retirement. Not a bad idea. Depends on where your taxes are. Roth conversions. You have chunks in there and you're in a relatively low income tax bracket, especially if you're retired. Let's do some conversions to fill up whatever tax bracket you're in, if it's in the 12% or the 22%, to pay at least 20, pay 22%. That's not that bad compared to what it could be or our kids could pay. So you look at, you work with your tax advisors every year and say, all right, how much can I convert and stay within that same bracket? So, or you just spend that money first. Spend that money first, or if you can't, and you know there's gonna be a huge embedded tax liability on these pre-tax accounts, you create a vehicle that's gonna pay the taxes for your estate so then your kids don't have to come out of other assets to pay for it. So there's no right or wrong answers. There's no like, this is what you have to do, but you wanna look, you wanna work with somebody that's gonna look at it cohesively and address your taxes over the three phases at your your, of your life, which is today, tomorrow, and at the transfer. Your CPAs, unfortunately, usually just look at today and say, what can we do to reduce your taxes on your 1040? That can be super detrimental to you in retirement and very detrimental to your kids when you transfer it. So, so if you got anything from that, try not to leave a pre-tax retirement account behind anybody, specifically your special needs trust. And the reason for that, a trust after you die has a different tax rate schedule, much worse than us as individual taxpayers. They hit those higher 37% brackets at much lower income. So let's say you leave a million dollar 401k and you have no other option, but it goes to the special third party special needs trust. There's gonna be a minimum distribution required from that. If that trustee doesn't end up spending it on your, on your loved one, that income is taxed at the trust rates, which could be much higher. There also could potentially be on government benefits and these distributions that are going to be required could disrupt their government benefit eligibility. So if you do have more than one heir, good tax planning says maybe we leave the pre-tax accounts to the other heirs and maybe leave some Roth, taxable investments, property, life insurance, whatever it might be, to the special needs trust. And maybe you can try to equalize things that way. So that's why you address this now rather than down the line. Do it, okay. All right, so again, Figuring out what you need, no one size fits all. Inflation is gonna be one of our biggest adversaries through all of this, through the rest of your lives and the rest of your child's life. Things are not getting less expensive overall. And there's new gizmos or gadgets that everybody buys now that we didn't even have 15, 20 years ago, right? So it's not just milk and bread and 
eggs and gasoline and healthcare going up. It's everybody needs the new iPhone. There's virtual reality now, self driverless cars. Who knows what the new technology is going to be in the future that we're going to end up spending our money on? All right, so this is a big, big topic. So we focus on what are the lifetime medical needs of this individual? But what about ours? And this comes into kind of your question about what do we do with when it's our spouse? So you think there is quality of life issues here, right? If you, if you have all this money in your names and you could pay for care at your home or in a quality facility, it's gonna come out of your own pocket to pay for that. And you might discount, well, what's my future financial solvency going to be because it, the quality of life of my loved one right now trumps that. And keeping them in the facility they wanna be in or keeping them in, in home is much more important to me than saying, let's get all this money out of your name so you look financially destitute. So then if you need extended care, you can go on Medicaid and then we can find a facility for you to go into. Not really the best scenario. But either way, if you are the primary caregiver for your spouse, we can't forget about your future lifetime care needs. So long-term care planning, notice I didn't say long-term care insurance. Long-term care planning is a must for, is anybody in here retired already? A couple people probably, who wants to retire someday? What do you think your, one of your biggest risks to retirement is? A major medical need for you. It could wipe out all of the legacy goals you have. It could wipe out all, all of the things that you're gonna to need to do for yourself. And if you already have a medical need, it could wipe out the financial ability for your spouse to sustain when you're, when you're gone. So these are things that definitely involve a different layer of planning to the specifics of your situations. Um, there, is, there are more than one strategies, though. You don't just go buy long-term care insurance. Do you self-fund it? Do you self-fund it to an extent? Do you do some Medicaid planning? Do you use life insurance that has a hybrid plan that involves life insurance and long-term care prop, um, specifics inside of it? Um, there's different, more innovative approaches to that risk nowadays. All right, so typically we're about 45 minutes into this. Heads are spinning from information overload. Where do you begin? I, I look, I'm biased to that. I think you should start with a certified financial planner. If it's me or somebody like me in your area, somebody that is going to first and foremost get you organized. Have these tough questions already. You died yesterday, what's tomorrow look like? Hardest question. You do have minor kids, who's gonna raise them? Who's the backup for that person? You have uh, money, you're gonna set up a special needs trust, who's gonna manage the money? Who's going to be the backup to that person? What about if a corporate fiduciary? Do you want to research some of that? You have other children. How do we equalize the estate? What ages do we, excuse me, allow those other children to have access to the money? Is it 25? I hope not. Maybe 25, 35, 45, or indefinitely for those other heirs. Know where everything's at and how everything's titled. The one thing you do not want to do is give your attorney more work to do. So if you can have these conversations, get organized financially, know where everything is, titled, where your insurance contracts are at, your investments are at, who beneficiaries are, who you want as your specific people in your estate planning documents, it makes that process a thousand times easier than you sit in front of the attorney, you're interviewing them, see if you like them, they're interviewing you, see if they like you, you agree upon their fee, and then you can get them started on drafting your documents and potentially have them done in two to three weeks, depending on your schedules. It makes it a lot easier and sitting down with the attorney and saying, I have no idea who we want, and we haven't talked about this, and I don't know, here's my bag of stuff, my statements, I don't know what's still there or not. Um, then they have to do all the work to get you organized, may charge you extra fees depending on how they're getting compensated. So whatever you do, at the end of the day, they do need to be co um, coordinated together. So your attorney will have your finalized, notarized documents, tax ID number potentially for this special needs trust, correct beneficiary titling for your IRA accounts, which is very important to then get that to you so you can work with your finance. See why I said get it to you so you can work with your financial advisor? Don't do this on your own. Please, if I can give you any advice, retirement planning for a 30 to 40 year in, um, retirement time frame and a lifetime beyond you, it, to me, is virtually impossible to navigate as a do-it-yourselfer. Too much tax planning, too much, there's new risks that present themselves. It's my stop talking reminder. <laughs> Way too much to try to become an expert on this. You have your own lives to be, and your own fields to be experts in. Pre-retirement planning, saving money, investments, I mean, that's not rocket science. Put it in the stock market, don't panic out, don't be greedy and chase silly returns. Stick to your guns, spend less than you make. That's kind of easy, but when you try to navigate 30 to 
to 60 years of retirement income. It's, a, it's an exercise in futility being a do-it-yourselfer. So getting your financial advisors involved with this, your insurance advisors, making sure that they're experts in what you need to do is, is a crucial component of this. Um, just to give you an idea how we work with clients, so like I said, I'm licensed all across the country. My office is about 30 minutes outside of the city. But um, should you want to have a first meeting? Our first meetings are always complimentary. My colleagues across the country, first meetings are complimentary if you want to sit down face to face with somebody. And what that first meeting should look like with any financial planner, you're getting to know them. What do they do? How do they do it? What are their philosophies? What are the strategies that they use? You're obviously getting an understanding that they, they know special needs and how things are different. At the same time, we're, talk, we're, we're learning more about you, what your goals are, what you're looking for. Do you have other advisors? Do we want to work with you? <laughs> That's the biggest thing we're trying to figure out. Uh, and then together, you mutually decide, do we move to a next step? What would those next steps look like? How do you, what does the scope of engagement possibly be? What are the fees? How are, they, how are we getting compensated? I like to get that out right at the beginning because, look, we do this for a living. I do it out of the kindness of my heart, too, because I love this. If I was financially independent, won the lottery, I'd still do these, these presentations. I enjoy it because it's getting information to you guys to help somebody that may not have a voice in all of this. They may not be at those, that kitchen table or that conference table with the financial advisors when decisions are made on their behalf. We get to be their advocate every day, three, four times a day in meetings. So um, if you need attorneys locally or where you are, there's a couple databases that I use to find attorneys that are in the area if I don't have an advisor out there that already knows some that are experts in special needs planning. Other resources. I wanted to, 10 years ago when I transitioned my practice into this, I wanted to, I realized that I didn't know everything. I didn't want to know everything, but I wanted to surround myself by people that did know what they knew in their areas of expertise. So if you need a resource for something else, I usually will know somebody or know someone that can help me get connected to somebody. So um, in summary, you guys know that your situation better than anybody else does. What you want for yourselves, what you want for your child. Do not, be, do not feel like you're just getting squeezed into this mold of what an advisor thinks you should be doing. Don't be the round peg in the, in the square hole. Your attorneys, vet them, ask them questions. If they can't explain to you in common five-year-old English what that legal document is doing, you might want to work with somebody else. I think that's really important for anything, financial planning or estate planning, that they can explain it to you in common language without acronyms and industry speak so you get you understand what you're doing. Um, but please take an active role in the planning. Realize that this really does fall on sh your shoulders as care parents, caregivers, partners, uh, spouses, whatever it might be. Um, and if there are any compliance or tax people, that's all my disclosures, that none of that was tax nor legal advice. Um, if you have your evaluation forms before we leave, because I know the next session essentially starts at 10, I'll collect that evaluation form from you. You want information, I'll get it to you. You want other people that are closer to you, I can get you their contact information. Um, or if you want to, there is one question on there that says, do you want to be contacted for initial meeting? That could be an initial phone call too. If you circle yes, what that means is I will follow up with an email, I will reach out to you uh, to try to schedule a time to talk. That means if I leave you a message, you will call me back because you said for me to call you. If you circle no, we won't call you. Send you an email thanking you guys for attending. Uh, I do have a special needs newsletter I send out that's all articles and information specific to special needs. Um, but please know in the future, if you ever need anything, I'm always here as a resource. Um, but by a real quick show of hands, everybody learned at least one new thing today? Good. Please let other families know these resources are out there. There's not many people like me across the country, but that when there are, is tell people there's resources out there that they can be tapping into. So I want to thank you guys for choosing me over the other breakout this morning. Um, if you have questions, uh, there is about 10 minutes before you need to move to the next breakout, or you can find me afterwards. Anybody have, want to throw out any questions? <laughs> So it doesn't count against anything income related. It's an asset that's not countable against them for uh, SSI. So it can have up to $100,000 in an ABLE account before an individual will lose their SSI eligibility. Uh, at least in Pennsylvania, and I don't think any of the other states have followed this either. I don't think there's a Medicaid limitation on ABLE accounts before Medicaid will get jeopardized. The downside of ABLE accounts, and they have been marketed as like this cure-all for special needs planning, which they are nowhere near that. You're limited to what you can spend it on, right? You can't spend it on anything. You can't go, to vac go on vacation or buy video games with it or do fun things with it. It all is the, are these disability-related expenses. So let me see, I'll come back here. So a disability-related expense, that's what you can only spend an ABLE account on. 
It's limited to how you can contribute, $15,000 a year, $100,000 in aggregate before SSI would be jeopardized. So it's just try to think about this. To quantify quality of life for your child, how many years at putting in only $15,000 would you need to live to have enough anywhere near to take care of your child? Too long. What's that? Well, there's fees. I mean, Pennsylvania uses Vanguard, so the fees are very inexpensive. They are, they've come out with a couple advisor-driven ABLE accounts, which I would never do. You don't need, to, you don't need advice to invest in an ABLE account. Um, the, the only thing is I would not want to restrict myself to the mutual funds to invest in. I wouldn't want to restrict myself on how I could use the money. Um, you could do a whole lot more by investing in your own name, even though you mentally might have it earmarked for your child or loved one and be able to use that money however you want and be able to invest in whatever you want. Our portfolios are all individual securities, individual stocks. I don't want to be picking, mutual, have mutual funds only to pick from. Um, so having a, your, your own brokerage account where you're investing in knowing it's your child's money, but in the government's eyes, they see it as yours, that's a much better way to go than funding an ABLE account out of your own assets. Now, if you're gonna spend money, like Pennsylvania, check your state, Pennsylvania gives residents a state income tax deduction for contributions. If you're going to spend money anyway on your child that's disability related, it might as well use an ABLE account like a health savings account or a flex spending account just like as a pass-through, not as an investment vehicle. So put it in, get the tax deduction, take it right back out to pay for the expense you're going to use. The individual themselves could contribute to an ABLE account. That might make sense, but I could still put a counter-argument counter out there where there's some better ideas. Yeah, the, the federal government passed it with a required Medicaid reimbursement on ABLE accounts. I know that at least the states around here did not put a Medicaid clawback clause on there. But it, if it goes to probate, there are some things that could happen. And, and look, they're new. You, you, I, don't, I don't even know if anybody in Pennsylvania has died yet that has had an ABLE account for them to deal with this. But uh, there are some better options. But if you, if you need something in a pinch to get money out of somebody's name and there's less than $15,000, it could, it could work better than going through the legal cost of drafting a first party special needs trust to do that. So. Correct. So that's a very good question. So one of the things people th think is you have to have a disability to have a special needs trust. You don't. All of us in here could have somebody that created a trust for us that has special needs provisions in there. My word of encouragement would be all assets left to your children, because there's the potential there, would all go into trust for them. An individual trust for each one of them that has the specific legalese in there that says this will function as a special needs trust if it needs to, but if it does not, it's not as restrictive. That way you have it just in case, but if it's not needed, um, it doesn't have to be as strict or restrictive. Does that, does that make sense? So. Well, thank you guys. I'll give you enough time to get back to your next, pre next presentation. I'll be at my table if you have other questions for the rest of today. Thanks, Ted. And also, y'all remember about the cars that